Good morning. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange team and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled, Evaluating Strategies for Increasing Native Plant Diversity in Crested Wheatgrass Seedings, presented by Kent McAdoo, from, uh, who is a Natural Resources Specialist with the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that you may ask questions of the speaker or me at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen. I will keep questions for the presenter in the queue and field them after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Kent McAdoo is a Natural Resources Specialist with the University of Nevada Co Cooperative Extension in Elko, Nevada. He has worked in northern and central Nevada for 38 years in various positions as a reclamation-focused ecologist for the mining industry, a senior ecologist with an environmental consulting firm, a wildlife research associate with the University of Nevada, Reno, and for the last 16 years with Cooperative Extension. Kent is a certified wildlife biologist and a certified professional in rangeland management and has served as past presidents for both the Nevada chapter of the Wildlife Society and the Nevada section of the Society for Range Management. Welcome, Kent, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Jeannie. All right, I'm making you the presenter. I see your go-to webinar screen. Right. You don't see the PowerPoint yet? Not yet. I see it now, but it's not in slideshow mode. Oh, you know what? I forgot to, uh, how do I? You can, um, let's see. I always go to the little icon that's on the bottom. I know on the top there's a, like, uh, let's see. Maybe if you go to home, and then there should be, like, a start slideshow button. Home. Uh, yeah, the, pro the problem is I've got two screens and it's showing apparently my Oh, you're other up. Screen. Uh, yeah. yeah, how did we show the other screen last time? That worked, that worked Friday. <laughs> yeah, I think um, in the top of your control panel there's a show my screen, like a blue circle with a white arrow. And then there's a little button underneath that says screen with a drop down arrow. And then Hang it... On one okay. Show my screen. Okay. I got it. And then if you click that drop-down arrow, um, it should have the, I think it'll have the options for which screen you're showing. The little screen button with the black drop-down arrow. Ah, yeah, there we go. Beautiful. Do you have it? Do you have it now? Yes, I do. Great. Excellent. All so right. can I proceed? Yeah, take it away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the opportunity to uh, make this webinar presentation. And I'd like to certainly acknowledge my, my co-authors, co-investigators, John Swanson and Peter Murphy with the University of Nevada, and also Nancy Shaw, recently retired from the U.S. Forest Service. I'd also like to acknowledge the funding we received from the Great Basin Native Plant Project. Uh, for some reason, I'm not, not advancing. Hmm. There we go. There we go. 
So the idea, the idea of actively diversifying crested wheatgrass seedings goes back at least as far as <clears throat> goes back. Excuse me, <clears throat> goes back at least to the work of of Cox and Anderson, where they talked about capturing disturbed sites uh, from weeds with crested wheatgrass, then reducing the crested wheatgrass with various treatments and seeding the sites with adapted native species. Um, in another publication in 2005, Pellant and Line talked about crested wheatgrass monocultures as bridge plant communities that could be replaced, or excuse me, that could replace weed dominated lands for potential future rehabilitation uh, in order to diversify the plant communities. One of the primary reasons for diversifying crested wheatgrass monocultures is to enhance wildlife habitat to, to, for the wildlife values in these areas. And in addition to um, sagebrush obligates that, that use uh, crested, excuse me, that, that use um, sagebrush grass habitats in the Great Basin, there's a host of other species that would benefit from diversification if we could diversify crested wheatgrass seedings. And I'm sorry, for some reason this is advancing very slowly. Uh, we certainly have seen this enhanced wildlife habitat over time with, with secondary succession, natural succession coming, to, coming into play on crested wheatgrass seedings. I was involved with research in the late 1980s that showed that in areas of um, in, in crested wheatgrass monocultures, between about 20 to 30 years after shrub control and seeding, we would end up with about 10% sagebrush cover. And with that much sage cover, we had almost an even split between sagebrush obligates, species like sage sparrows, sage thrashers, brewer sparrows, and then grass nesting birds like uh, horned larks, um, lark sparrows, and so on. The objectives of this particular research were to evaluate various treatments for reducing crested wheatgrass in near monoculture stands and then to uh, also take a look at the effect of this crested wheatgrass control, the various methods of control, on establishment of seeded native species. And ours was just one of four studies um, that were being conducted in, in, four, in four states, Utah, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, across the uh, Intermountain West. Two of those have been published, one by Fanzler and Mangold, an Oregon study, and one by Hewlett et al. Uh, in Utah. Our study started a little later and measured results over five growing seasons instead of three. Our study design uh, reflected those of the, of the other studies that, that, that took place. And, um, the main thing to emphasize is that we used we had two trial sites, and at each of those sites we uh, used f five four hectare blocks with a randomized block split plot design, and then uh, each of the of the treatment plots within each block was divided into seeded and, and unseeded subplots. I've displayed here the treatment chronology uh, for both of those treatment areas for both of those um, for those both of those sites. And the thing to really emphasize, I guess, uh, besides the fact that these were seeded, the first the trial one was seeded in early October of 2008. Trial two was seeded in late, excuse me, late October 2008. And trial two was seeded in late October 2010. But the major differences in the two, two different trials was that in the first trial, we compared uh, four control treatments for crested wheatgrass, and those were spring applied glyphosate, spring and fall applied glyphosate, glyphosate plus disking and disking by itself, plus of course a, a treatment or a comparison to an untreated area. In trial two, we had four herbicide treatments. We, we learned from our first trial that uh, disking was, uh, didn't, didn't work well at all, as you'll see from the results. and uh, at that time, results coming in from those other studies was showing that, dis that disking was not effective. So in the second trial, we, we looked at two glyphosate treatments, a full rate and half rate, as well as treatment with uh, two other chemicals, Landmark XB, which is a combination of 
the active ingredients chlorosulfuron plus sulfuron methyl, and then also imazepic, uh, we use the panoramic brand. Basically, it's, it's a uh, plateau is another, another brand that, that um, where uh, imazepic is the active ingredient, uh, ingredient that everybody's familiar with. The seed mix that we used uh, was based on ecological site description for the area from NRCS. And we seeded a total of six perennial native perennial grass species, three forb species, and two, two shrub species. And what we did was put um, we had the larger seeds were, were in a in the drill mix and the smaller seeds were in a broadcast mix. The seeds were applied by using a true axe rough rider minimum till drill. And this was configured to drill and broadcast the seed in alter, alternate rows with optimal depth for germination and emergence. And in, in case you're not familiar with, um, with this setup, basically you can see in this photograph the, the brilliant packer wheels that are placed immediately after the drop to, tubes to press the broadcast seeds into the ground. And you can also see the chains uh, behind the wheels that uh, uh, cover the, the drilled seeds with soil. One of the things that I should bring to your attention is this, this particular setup has been modified since then. At the time we used it, there were no mud scrapers available to remove accumulated soil that you see on those brilliant wheels. And that's been modified since then and, and results in a better, in a better setup. I won't go into data collection in detail, but primarily to say that um, we collected our data at the end of, uh, of excuse me, at the end of the growing season, and uh, for the for trial one, we collected data in the first, second, third, and fifth years after seeding. In trial two, we collected data during the second and third years after seeding. One of the key variables that was at play uh, during the study, obviously, was precipitation. And you can see uh, a summary here, precipitation by quarter for the water year. And also, you can see we've uh, delineated it out into the crop year as well. And of particular inter interest, notice that um, during the spring of, of uh, 2009, we had 133 millimeters of precipitation. And for that crop year, which the crop year is, is October through uh, June, we had 119% of normal. And as you'll see, that really uh, allowed us to have great establishment uh, for, the, for trial one. What you also notice is another good precip year in 2000, excuse me, 2010-11, where the crop year, during the crop year, we had 124% of normal precipitation. But in the next two years, we had 55% and 58% of normal, respectively. And so as you can imagine, it looks like these, uh, this, this precipitation regime impacted our results, and we'll get into that. So looking, first of all, at, at just visually what was going on in the landscape, this is, this is trial one. And, uh, and you can see here uh, depicted in a clockwise fashion, the untreated versus the spring spray versus the uh, combined spring and fall spray. And glyphos glyphosate was the chemical we were using, the only chemical we were using on, on, in this trial. And um, these treatments significantly reduced crest of wheatgrass cover and density um, at the 95% confidence level. Similarly, when we used disking plus glyphosate, uh, crest of wheatgrass was also significantly re reduced. Disking itself did not uh, result in, in significant crest of wheatgrass reduction, and this was particularly true of um, of uh, disking, as we'll as we'll see, or excuse me, of, of uh, crest of wheatgrass density. This table this this figure, excuse me, displays results of both trials one and trial two. This is percent cover of crested wheatgrass by treatment, and this is across years. The uh, treatments on the screen from left to right are disking, disking plus glyphosate, glyphosate, 
uh, the double glyphosate treatment and, and the untreated. This that's for trial one. For trial two, the CS is the is the landmark uh, herbicide. The I is Mazepic or the uh, panoramic herbicide. G glyphosate and then a half rate glyphosate and then untreated. It's it's also important to point out and for understanding of this um, of this figure that you can see the various shading for the years of, of sampling. And you can also see starting with 2009 and going through 2013. And it's and also the um, we looked at treatment across years. And so for a treatment, a group of, of treatment bars without a common letter uh, denotes difference at uh, at the 0.05 level of significance. And uh, so for trial one, what we see here is that is that the uh, the glyphosate treatments, whether it was the spring applied glyphosate, the double glyphosate treatment, spring and fall, or the glyphosate plus disking, resulted in um, in reduced significantly reduced reduction, or excuse me, significant reduction in crested wheatgrass cover, and this is across across years. For trial two. Uh, where we compared four different herbicide treatments, only the glyphosate treatment significantly reduced crested wheatgrass cover. There was no um, significant um, effect of either the landmark or the um, um, panoramic treatment. Then taking a look at crested wheatgrass density, the results for trial one were very similar to what we saw uh, for crested wheatgrass cover. We see that for the most part the glyphosate treatments, any treatment with glyphosate, whether it's the single treatment, the double uh, spring plus fall treatment, or glyphosate plus disking, we saw a reduction, significant reduction in, um, in crested wheatgrass density. However, looking at the at trial two, we we saw actually an increase in um, uh, in crested wheatgrass density as a result of the glyphosate treatments. I really don't have a good explanation for this, but it actually looks like the glyphosate stimulated uh, crested crested wheatgrass density in the second trial. The other thing to notice, particularly in trial one, is you see a spike for the 2011 results each year. And keep in mind that uh, during 2011, um, that that might be related to the fact that we had 124 percent of normal precipitation during the crop year. So I'd like to show you visually what was going on out there during trial one, and uh, also to mention that of the 11 species that we seeded, um, nine of those 11 were were were, were growing. Uh, were germinating and growing D during the first growing season in trial one. The only species that we did not see uh, coming up as a result of seeding were the Sandberg's bluegrass and the spiny hopsage. And we never did see spiny hopsage come up in either trial. So it was a pretty amazing year with that 119 um, percent of normal precipitation. You can see the Forbes did quite well. Quite well. This uh, large plant here is um, Monroe Globe Mallow. The next picture is um, Western Yarrow. And many of the Forbes produced uh, produced flowers and, and set seed that that first growing season. Here's a picture of flowering Lewis flax. Again, this is trial one during the first growing season. And here you can see some seeded grass species coming up in the drill rows. A close-up of some basin wild rye um, coming from, from seed. Indian rice grass. You can also see some forbs in the, in the foreground and so on. And we had an occasional sagebrush show up. Not many, but but we did uh, we did get a few in our transects. So looking overall at uh, total 
total seeded species density by treatment, and this is again across years. Uh, in these two trials, we look at trial one on the left and trial two on the right. This is set up like the uh, previous, like the previous figures were, so you can see the uh, shaded coloring for the years, and you can see the treatments down below. And what we notice here is that, um, well, one of the things you really notice in trial one, where we did sample the same growing season that we, uh, or the growing season immediately following planting is that we had a pretty good establishment of the total species that you know across all species in each treatment this declined sharply in the second year and the other studies basically showed the same thing the ones in Utah and um, and Oregon and so that's why we didn't sample the first growing season in, in trial two but the other thing I want to mention about trial one is that, again, the glyphosate treatments where we had our best control of the crested wheatgrass, we also had significantly better establishment of our, um, of our seeded species. We also had this occur in, in trial two as well, where we had the more successful treatment of crested wheatgrass in terms of reduction by, uh, by glyphosate you can see that there's a significant difference between the glyphosate treatment and the other two, um, the other two chemicals that were used, the landmark and panoramic treatments. So I think visuals are a good thing to take a look at as we're, as we're figuring out what happened on the landscape. And, uh, the third growing season out there was what I like to call the good, the bad, and the ugly. We had a field trip out there to, to look at this. And uh, we saw some great success, of three, three growing seasons after trial one, um, and uh, also some very interesting other results as well. Keep in mind that during 2011, we had another high precip year. I've got that highlighted there in yellow. And what we were seeing was good uh, persistence of our seeded species. Many of them were very robust, especially the forbs. You can see the flowering uh, western yarrow in this picture. You can also see some seeded uh, Wyoming big sagebrush in the foreground. Here's a close-up of some seeded sagebrush as well as some yarrow. But the other thing that was going on was, uh, in, in many areas, great crested wheatgrass recovery. And that was probably also linked to this, uh, this higher precip year. Uh, in some areas, the crested wheatgrass looked like it was on steroids. It was, it was recovering very, very well. Then the ugly part of this was in areas where we had done the best job of, of controlling crested wheatgrass with glyphosate, we had a a pretty strong in invasion of tumble mustard. Basically, this was just an ephemeral thing. It, it um, did not last with any significance into the ensuing years. But um, again, keep in mind this was that, that high precip year, the third third growing season after planting trial one. So on this same topic of of weed cover, what we see when we look at what we saw when we take a look at trial one and trial two. And, and when we talk about weed cover here, the primary weed we had out there was, was tumble mustard. We also had some halogeton, Russian thistle, kochia, and prickly lettuce. Those were the, the primary weeds with, um, with tumble mustard dominating. But one of the things you see right away in trial one is the spike in 2011 that we've already mentioned may have been, um, um, for everything out there, possibly a result of... Um, of the precip that year, but across both year, or excuse me, across both across the years for both trials in general, we had more weeds where the herb where the herbicide treatments were effective in reducing crested wheatgrass. We see that both for the uh, for trial one and trial two, although um, at lower levels certainly in trial two. And keep in mind that in 2012 and 13 which were the two years, the only two years of sampling for trial two, 
uh, those were years of 50, 55 and 58 uh, percent of normal crop year precipitation. There were some challenges out there and um, one of those was depredation by black-tailed jackrabbits. I've been involved in prior studies where we've seen that um, jackrabbits can definitely have, have strong impacts on seedings. And uh, this particular photograph is, is one taken from a study we did back in the uh, late 1980s. But in a companion, another study related to the, the study I'm discussing here on crested wheatgrass diversification, we completed a, a, a study on sagebrush transplanting that was published in Rangeland Ecology and, Man and Management 2013. Uh, where we saw that, uh, where, where it was obvious that, that uh, the jackrabbit populations were so high, and this is in the same area, by the way, where we were doing this crested wheatgrass diversification for the present study, where jackrabbits were actually cutting off and pulling up the, the young sagebrush that we had planted. And if you look at the literature, say, uh, excuse me, black-tailed jackrabbits are very, are very attracted to young vegetation, and there's no doubt that they were having an impact, although we did not measure it on some of our seeded vegetation in the sage in the crest of wheatgrass diversification study. One of the things that was very obvious visually, there was no livestock grazing in this area. This is fenced off. And uh, but we had tremendous waste cutting by jackrabbits of, of even the older established crest of wheatgrass. So there were some impacts going on out there. This is just a, kind of an overview, a summary of, and of management implications as a result of our study. Uh, disking treatments are ineffective, we think, in reducing crested wheatgrass cover and actually in, increase crested wheatgrass density in some cases. The panoramic chemical and uh, landmark were both ineffective at suppressing, at suppressing crested wheatgrass. Glyphosate treatments were effective in reducing crested wheatgrass cover, but that effectiveness diminished over time as the crested wheatgrass rebounded. And uh, we think that if, if, these, if this type of method is used, retreatment's going to be, some type of retreatment would be necessary to reduce that competition. We also saw during our study, and, and other studies have borne this out, that reducing crested wheatgrass certainly opens a window for weed invasion. In our situation, we didn't have a cheatgrass challenge, but we, we did see that, that invasion, the heavy invasion of, um, of the tumble mustard. And then the other thing that I think is obvious, obvious in our study is that after initial establishment of the seeded native species, we had a, a steady decline in survival in successive years as the crest of wheatgrass rebounded, and that appeared to be at least partially precipitation related. I think there's other ideas to pursue with regard to crested wheatgrass reduction. Uh, one of those might be an idea of reducing crested wheatgrass residual biomass um, before herbicide use. In other words, some, something like targeted grazing or prescribed fire to, to make sure the chemical, the herbicide applied is, is getting on, on the green, on, on the, uh, the growing uh, crested wheatgrass plants. In our situation with, with no grazing out there at all, well, except for some jackrabbits, um, a lot of the chemical was uh, was not getting to the cr the crested wheatgrass as good as it might have if we had uh, taken care of the residual biomass. Other ideas for research might be to improve the timing of glyphosate application. Uh, although we tried a fall treatment, in particular fall we did that. We didn't have a good green up, and certainly there's information in the literature that shows if you get fall green up. There's a much better uh, success rate for crested wheatgrass control. Another idea would be, uh, obviously, to look at reentry re treatments for, for spot control of crested wheatgrass reduction, although if you've got uh, the seeded native grasses coming in, that's going to have to be done carefully, and, and that's why I've emphasized, emphasized spot control. Something that could be just explored, perhaps, is that is the use of a pre-emergent herbicide. We use plat a, a plateau equivalent here, but we, we were not using it in a pre-emergent sense. And um, looking at a pre-emergent to reduce crested wheatgrass seed bank might be an idea. And uh, especially if, if uh, the focus became on, on patch treatments, in other words, trying to treat 
several areas out there in a large seeding, specifically just, just to get some parent populations of plants that could, could then uh, populate an area. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kent. Um, yeah, so uh, attendees, if you have questions, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel. Um, we'll start with Eric Limbaugh. He asks, in testing for different effects among your three herbicides, could the enhancement under glyphosate be due to its soil, envi due to its soil environment comes seed friendly sooner than the other two chemicals? Oh, become seed friendly. Doesn't glyphosate biodegrade relatively quickly after application? Yes, yes, and and that and that's definitely a possibility. I don't know the answer, but but it's definitely a possibility. Great. All right. I'm waiting for the more questions to come into the questions box. This is a hot topic. I can't imagine that would be the only question. <laughs> That um, photograph with all the jackrabbits was amazing. I've never seen anything like that. It's uh, we uh, what, what I didn't mention is in that particular area where we did this crest of wheatgrass diversification study and where we did the, the transplant study adjacent to it, uh, we were seeing jackrabbits in abundance every time we were out there. Uh, their pellets were everywhere. It was it was a high it was a period of high jackrabbit population. And uh, and they were having an impact. We but we we did not measure it. Wow. Okay, Chris Sheridan asks: Can Kent speculate on survival of plugs versus seed in this type of treatment? You know, um, I would think that plugs might have an advantage, and and I'm not sure if you're talking about herbaceous. Um, if you're talking about, for example, perennial grass plugs, but uh, I think that they might have a, an advantage. There might be a comp that they might not be competing at, at the same time period. Um, in other words, when those young plants are becoming established from from seed, um, there's some there's some competition challenges out there, and so starting with the with the plug might give that a jump start. Certainly, we saw that in our in our transplant study with um, with sagebrush. Uh, you have a period where, you know, seeds of anything, but in, in our case, the sagebrush would be would be competing for, would be a, at a competitive disadvantage to the grasses out there. But transplanting vegetation kind of um, puts us in a position where we're past that particular high level of competition, and and puts you in a situation where there's there's some niche differentiation going on. And so, plug vegetation or transplanted ve vegetation might indeed have a better chance to uh, to compete, just to avoid that that uh, early early period of high competition. I didn't articulate that well, but hopefully, mm -hmm. it was understandable. Thanks, Linus Meyer asks: Were there any soil loss or erosion studies done on the study plots? <clears throat> no, there weren't. Um, is, is the short answer. Okay, great. <laughs> Karen <clears throat> Beery asks, what is the age of the crested wheatgrass seedings? Would age of seeding be a consideration for reseeding with natives? You know, this this seeding was older. Uh, this seeding was put into place as I, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I believe in the 1970s. And age of seeding could come into play, but um, but you know, if those crested wheatgrass are are well established, uh, there's a lot more going on underground than, than above ground, obviously. And uh, but to a certain extent, uh, maybe uh, a newer seeding would be would be one that might have a better chance for crested wheatgrass control and establishment of seeded species. But but once the sage once the crested wheatgrass are um, well established, I, I think. The challenge is likely to be similar, regardless of the age of the seeding. Great, thanks. Lynn Danley asks, do you think the crested return was due to seed bank, or was this recovery of established grasses? It was definitely both. 
uh, we are you still there? Yeah, sorry, I just had to cough. I didn't want everyone to hear Hello? it. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It sounded, it sounded like everything went dead. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> um, would you repeat the question? Yeah, Lynn Danley asks, do you think the crested return was due to the seed bank or was this recovery of established grasses? Okay, thanks. It was definitely both. We saw we saw new new seedlings coming in, but we also saw um, we also saw crowns of, of established crested uh, basically recovering and doing quite well. So both both were going on definitely. Great, thanks. Karen Krauss asks, has the presenter done work? Um, to intercede Forbes without the reduction of crested wheatgrass and what kind of results has he seen with this kind of treatment? Yes, we have. It, during this study, I probably didn't dwell on that long enough, but uh, we had in each, in each of those blocks, we had um, plots for, that were untreated. And so the untreated would, would be half of that untreated uh, portion would be seeded and half would be unseeded. So we seeded directly into the crested wheatgrass in each situation and just had extremely poor success. I, I should modify that and say that uh, during trial one when we had the phenomenal first year um, of precipitation and we sampled the growing season right after seeding, we saw some some of the seeded vegetation coming up in those uh, treated areas, excuse me, untreated areas, but those those plants were gone by the second growing season. They just couldn't handle the competition. Great, thanks. Jacob Davidson asks, it seemed like there were some benefits from the disking treatments, less weeds, etc. Could, could you review the disking results briefly and discuss why you felt that treatment type was ineffective? Yeah, the, the treatment particularly as it related, the disking treatment particularly, and can, can I back this up, Jenny, will that yeah. work? uh-huh. Okay. Let's see. The bottom line was that, okay, here we go. What we saw with disking, and that's on the left side of the screen in trial one, is that there was no significant difference across years between disking and, and no treatment represented by the U on, on the right side of the trial one. And, and uh, so then when you look at, that's for crested wheatgrass cover, and when you see crested wheatgrass density, uh, there was not a significant difference between untreated and, um, and the disking. <laughs> You can see that biologically it might have been a real difference, but the bottom line is it was um, it, it was not significant from the untreated, and it was significantly much higher than the uh, density we got from treating with uh, any of the treatments involving glyphosate. Glyphosate in the spring, glyphosate spring and fall, and the disking combined with glyphosate. So hopefully that that answers the question. I should say too. I'm trying to remember those other two published studies. I know that in at least one of the two, uh, they also saw that, that uh, especially with density, um, it just seems to result in higher density with, with, the, uh, with the disking treatment. Hopefully that answers the question. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Um, so that's the last question I see, but if people are still typing in their questions, I can give my little closing remarks, and, um, and if I see more questions come in, then I will ask them. Um, but I would like to let you know that we'd greatly appreciate it if you would take our three questions survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended. A recording of this webinar will be sent to you automatically through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow and will also be posted on the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange website in the near future. Um, and for those of you who have participated in, in other webinars in this series, I know I'm a bit behind in posting those webinars on <clears throat> our website. However, they all are up on our YouTube channel. <clears throat> so if you go to our Great Basin Fire Science Exchange YouTube channel, you'll see them there. 
Um, and our 10th webinar in this series, titled Increasing Integration of Pollinator-Friendly Forbs and Wildland Restoration, presented by Byron Love, will take place this Wednesday, April 1st. Um, if you have more questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please call or email me at any time. Okay, it doesn't look like any further questions have come in, so thank you all for your participation today, and thank you so much, Kent, for your presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Judy, and uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the NRCS Aberdeen Plant Material Center team. They did all of our all of our planting out there, and for certainly for Thanks go to Jim Truax for working with us on that on that drill setup. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks so much. Have a great Thank day, you. everybody. Thanks.